The first thing I wanted to do was take a, a minute to recognize Emily McKay and the BSC staff for uh, putting this on and, and your efforts in hosting this fantastic launch. I appreciate it. It was. It's just great for us to, to have the opportunity to get together as an industry and have the conversation the panelists we're having today. Um, and I was struck by we were doing this in the building that was actually largely built on, uh, through the support of the energy industry and many of the companies in the room today. So I wanted to recognize that as well uh, before introducing uh, Commissioner Clark, who quite honestly really doesn't need an introduction. It's more of a welcome home. Uh, Commissioner Tony Clark was Nominated by President Obama in 2012 uh, to serve on the FERC Commission. Um, he is serving a five-year term. Uh, prior to being nominated, he uh, actually has a 20-year experience in public service. It doesn't look like when he steps up here. He started on the North Dakota Legislature at the ripe old age of 23 um, and then spent 12 years on the North Dakota Public Service Commissioner as, Commission as a commissioner as well. I have personally had the opportunity to spend time in the field with Tony and have always walked away with an appreciation of his commitment ultimately to the customers, ratepayers he serves on the fronts of reliability, of cost, and care for the environment. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Tony Clark. Thanks, Wade, and thank you for the invitation to, to be with you here today. Wade was uh, indicating we're making a few last-minute adjustments here. This is one of those sort of technological lessons that you learn along the way. I had about three or four great slides that would have really impressed you, but somewhere in the translation between my uh, keyboard and getting them here, something didn't work. So it's fine. We'll get through. There really weren't that many that I, uh, that I had, but uh, we'll just adjust a little on the fly. I, uh, I have to tell you, last week, when I was in uh, Washington, I was giving a speech to a, a group, and it, the Holy Land was on everyone's mind because the, uh, the Pope had just been to D.C., and it was a big deal. And I, I was telling the, the group that I was uh, preparing to go give a, a future speech in the, the Holy Land, and they uh, seemed so impressed that I didn't have the heart to tell them that I was actually talking about this particular speech that I was planning to give because I was coming back to North Dakota. Um, <laughs> But it is an honor to, uh, to be back home with, uh, with all of you. What, what I thought I would probably do today in the time that we have, and hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions uh, afterwards, but is to discuss, first is going to be this, first we'll have the educational portion of the, my presentation, which is going to be kind of a FERC 101. Here's what FERC does. Here's what the states do. I think every now and then it, it makes sense to kind of step back and talk about the, the regulatory compact that we have and exactly who does what in terms of a division of duties. That's going to be the, uh, the CLE portion, I think, is what Wayne called that uh, earlier today. The CLE portion of this will be, will be that. In fact, I sometimes, sometimes laugh. I'll go to these seminars, you know, that they put on in, in Washington and hear a guy who didn't spend a day in law school, uh, they'll, they'll give CLEs for some talk that I'm giving, and, which I think is actually kind of funny. I think, I mean, just imagine had I gone to law school, I might have been able to make something of myself if I'm... <laughs> giving these presentations. Anyway, people pay for these things, and apparently it allows them to keep practicing law listening to me. Uh, so that'll be our educational portion of it. And then we're, I, what I'll do is transition to some things that I think are the big headlines in energy in terms of where the nation is going forward, some things that we need to be on the lookout for, because I think there are some huge issues that we need to be, uh, that we need to be watching and are going to affect North Dakota specifically. And hopefully I'll end on a little bit of a, a positive note. So turning to sort of FERC 101, federal jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, what, is, what does FERC do versus what do state governments do? Uh, FERC oversees wholesale energy markets, and the key in that term is wholesale. So if it's, a, if it's a sale of electricity, if it's a sale of natural gas between two entities that aren't ultimately the end user that consumes that product, and that's a FERC jurisdictional sale. 
So regional transmission organizations, ISOs, sales of natural gas at a wholesale level, all those things are regulated by the federal government under the Natural Gas Act or under the Federal Power Act. Retail sales of electricity, the, the end use customer who actually uses the product, that's something that's regulated by your state public service commission or sometimes by markets and retail choice uh, states around the country. A big change in the last 10 years, and we're actually at now the 10 year anniversary just in August, uh, was something that uh, it was really the last major piece of legislation that Congress has passed with regard to energy policy. It was called EPAC 2005, Energy Policy Act of 2005. Uh, added significant duties to FERC and form really a big part of the backbone of what we do right now. Uh, EPAC 05, there were two events that really spurred Congress and spurred uh, the, the uh, administration at the time. And it passed overwhelmingly bipartisan support signed by President Bush at the time and has been implemented by FERCs that are both Republican majority and Democrat majority in the years since. EPAC 05 was was really pushed forward by two big events. One was the Western energy crisis that we all remember very well and Enron and the meltdown of California and the issue of market manipulation was at the center of that. The second was the issue of electric reliability. So the Western energy crisis was 2000, 2001. The Great Northeast blackout was 2003. It was 2005, Congress passes the Energy Policy Act of 05. It did a couple of big things with regard to manipulation and with regard to reliability. On the manipulation side, prior to that, FERC had actually fairly weak enforcement authority over market manipulation. There was market manipulation authority that we had, but it was only about $10,000 per violation that the commission could, uh, could levy per day. Uh, Congress decided to get serious about it, and they did in a major way. FERC, after EPAC 05, can find violations, $1 million per violation per day for an entity that violates anti-manipulation rules. So we have a lot of cases that deal with those type of issues. I won't get into any in, in any particular detail, but it interested me that there was actually one that crossed my desk, a settlement that, that we approved for, I think, about $7 million. It actually affected a wind farm right here in North Dakota. I don't know that this received a lot of press in particular. It was a few years ago, but I certainly remembered it because it was at a wind farm that I remember being at the ribbon cutting of. In fact, I think it was one that I may have helped shovel the dirt on the first, uh, on one of those golden shovels, you know, that they, they hand out. It was the Velva wind farm uh, that was uh, uh, developed and in, in XL Power was the, the purchaser of that wind. In that particular instance, you had a, a case where an energy trader was able to create a scenario in which they create what they called false congestion. Basically, if you remember Enron, remember a lot of the Enron payments were made. If you could create the appearance of there can be congestion on the system, and then you could, you could sort of leverage your congestion rights that you as a trader had into big money. Uh, but there really wasn't any congestion on the system. It was just traders making sort of false trades around to make it look like there was. Uh, in that particular case, it involved that particular wind farm. And the, uh, the trader, I think, earned uh, like an immediate $3 million profit over those, um, those particular trades. The, the interesting thing in that case was that, uh, and this was all, as I said, settled, and they, they paid a fine for it and disgorged the money. In that particular case, the trader at stake, or the trader at the, at the heart of the investigation, FERC staff found, had actually written a doctoral dissertation on a statistical analysis on how you could do exactly the thing that was happening in <laughs> North Dakota. So be careful with those PhD dissertations if you're <laughs> planning to manipulate energy markets. So FERC oversees that aspect of, of market manipulation. And then the second big leg of that, as I said, was this issue of reliability. Prior to Energy Policy Act of 2005, as hard as this is to believe, all of those standards that industry dealt with, with regard to keeping the lights on, rules of the road for reliability, those were all voluntary standards. And what changed was after EPAC 05, those standards that are promulgated through the North American Energy Reli Electricity Reliability Council, or NERC, who you'll sometimes hear about, uh, those standards became, via FERC, both mandatory and enforceable. So a utility that doesn't follow the rules of the road uh, can be fined. The good news coming out of Energy Policy Act of 2005 is, in, in many ways, in most ways, when you look at the, the reasons that we have traditionally had blackouts in this country, 
we are in a much better position than we had been before. Most of the things that have traditionally caused large reliability blackouts are the, really the basics. It's things like training, making sure that your staff is trained and know what they're doing. All those training steps are now mandatory. Tree trimming, um, visibility across the grid, really the basic nuts and bolts of how you keep the electricity lights on. We are much, much better at doing that than we've ever been in the past. And while we will probably still have blackouts from time to time, it's much less likely that it'll come from those reasons. The current threats to the grid are coming from a different set of challenges that Congress probably didn't envision exactly at that time, but, but EPACT 05 has served us well. The challenges to the grid now, as much as anything, are coming through things like cyber attacks. Our grid is consistently being, and every day, thousands of times a day, is being challenged and cyber attacked. The ecosystem of security that utilities have to abide by is set up through that FERC process, the mandatory reliability standard process. Uh, other threats to the grid that have evolved have been things like physical security of the grid. This is a more recent one. FERC just promulgated a number of rules on it. For the longest time, we knew physical attacks to the grid could cause a problem, but there was an event in California a couple of years ago which has come to be known as the Metcalf incident. It's a substation, in, the Metcalf substation in California. It was a very sophisticated attack on a substation, a critical one, an important one. And this wasn't a couple of high school kids out drinking beer with their shotguns, taking pops at the transformers. This was a coordinated, sophisticated attack to the point where you had communication lines being cut at the same time that very specific targets within that substation were being hit. It was a sophisticated attack. And it re it made everyone realize that we have a, an interest in also protecting key physical infrastructure on the grid itself. So now that's become mandatory. A third area which FERC has become involved in more recently is things like geomagnetic disturbances. We've always known that these things are out there, but now there are a set of standards that utilities are expected to undergo to ensure that they're doing the things they need to do in case we have a major solar storm that could potentially knock out portions of the grid. So we've seen the act evolve in terms of FERC's authority and where we're moving with it, but it's really, it, it has served as well. Uh, other areas that FERC uh, deals with, FERC licensed all the non-federal hydro projects across the country. It's actually the first thing that FERC was given back when it was the Federal Power Commission in the 1920s. Uh, most of the dams, of course, here are federal dams, so we don't oversee those. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, things like that are shared with, with states, but uh, interstate transmission lines, cost allocation, something that, that FERC does. So what do the states do? Well, states still have authority over that retail service provider. So the actual customer that has to buy that power, that's a, that's a state-regulated activity. And states have wide latitude in how to treat their utilities under that regime. They can choose to have bundled, investor, uh, bundled vertically integrated utilities, as is the case here in North Dakota. They can have those utilities participating in a broader regional market, which in the case of North Dakota we have, both in MISO and now as of October 1st with the WAPA and Basin Heartland Integrated System integration into SPP of a second market that's operating here in the upper Midwest. And I'm proud to report that as of this date, that integration has gone fairly well. We've been at it just a little over two weeks. I asked FERC staff and they said, well, there have been always the little things that happen when you integrate a new system into a, uh, into a market. On the whole, it's gone uh, quite well. So thanks to all of you from Basin and Western uh, who've been working on that because it's a, a major undertaking. And then states do an awful lot with things like renewable portfolio mandates if they choose to have them, something we call PURPA requirements, renewable energy credits, all those are things that are driven by state public policy. Now I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about where the, the big headlines are in terms of where we're moving with energy policy. In my mind, the, if you had to put one headline number one, it would be something along the lines of infrastructure development is going to be key, but it's getting a lot tougher to develop that infrastructure. And this is a real challenge in terms of the tension that exists right now between building infrastructure and the importance of infrastructure that we've got coming forward. Uh, for the longest time, all of us has probably heard about uh, that term NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard, NIMBY intervention. So whenever a public utility commission uh, holds a, uh, or a FERC in the case of infrastructure that we cite, uh, 
in those cases where we, uh, we cite some infrastructure, you'll have lots of people submit comments, and some of them are what we call NIMBY comments. Now, it can be a challenge for regulators because you have to sift through what's kind of a legitimate comment and what is just, don't put this on my land, but put it on my neighbor's <laughs> land sort of comment. But the, there is a value in NIMBY intervention in utility uh, cases, and it's this. There are certain pieces of property in which you shouldn't put infrastructure, right? I mean, you don't want it too close to schools. You don't want it on cultural, historic, environmental land, things like that. The only way that you get that information in the hearing process is by having the public comment and having landowners comment and say, here's where we think it should go or it shouldn't go. So there's actually some value in it, although it can be sometimes frustrating to tease that out amongst all the, the wheat and chaff as you go about separating it. The type of comment and intervention that we are increasingly seeing at FERC, and you're seeing it in, in a lot of states, is not NIMBY comment and, and intervention. Instead, what it is is what I call NOPE, N-O-P-E, not on planet Earth. <laughs> this intervention is a lot different. This isn't, I'm a landowner, please put this here as opposed to here. This is, I don't want any infrastructure built for any reason anywhere. And that's a different type of intervention that's much more challenging. One of the concerns that I have as a regulator is we have to sift through all these comments that come in. We need to make sure that we still pay attention to those really legitimate concerns that landowners have and that their voices aren't crowded out and overshouted by those who just simply don't want any infrastructure anywhere because they don't believe that we need it. One of the keys about infrastructure development is this. It's quite clear from where some of the markets are taking us, but also especially where environmental regulations seem to be pushing us, that there are two sources of generation that are gonna be increasingly relied on to keep our system working, and that's renewables and natural gas. Um, but it's important to remember, renewables, if there's one thing we know about them, they do not work over a small geographic area. You have to spread renewables out over a large geographic area because they're variable energy resources and you have to be able to make the grid work by shifting the power from where they're producing at one time to where it's needed at one time. So the key to making that work is transmission. Transmission's not always necessarily easy to site. It's a difficult infrastructure to site. In fact, for the longest time, I would have said trans electric transmission infrastructure is more difficult to site than pipelines. And that was from my experience on the, the North Dakota PSC. A lot of the reason is because with a transmission line, it's above ground, the landowner who didn't want it there in the first place has to look at it for the next 45 years and curse that thing that crosses their line. Pipelines, for the most part, are out of sight, out of mind. Once they're built and they're reclaimed, it's much less of an issue. I think they're probably equally difficult to site at this point, and that's the other key thing, is that in order to make renewables work, you need some sort of backup, and the backup is increasingly natural gas because we have an affordable supply of natural gas. Natural gas units can ramp up and down quickly and respond to the renewables. And so it's in, in addition to that, as you have coal shutdowns in certain parts of the country, you have to have a baseload resource to replace the coal. So you need the pipelines to back up the renewables. Pipelines are probably equally as difficult to cite these days. Something I didn't mention in my FERC Responsibilities 101 intro was that FERC has comprehensive authority over interstate natural gas pipelines. That is one area where Congress stepped in and gave FERC uh, basically total authority over the interstate natural gas pipeline system from the economics of it to what they can charge to where it can go to siting all of it. And I can tell you that it's a challenge these days. FERC for the last eight, at least a year, probably 18 months, at most of our public meetings, we just expect that they will be now interrupted at some point or another because they'll be interrupted and disrupted by a, a protester. Uh, we've had in the last month hunger strikes outside FERC's office. We've had people chaining themselves to PVC pipe to prevent employees from driving into the parking lot, uh, blocking entrance. There have been arrests at, uh, at FERC for various things. Uh, sometimes they're creative. They did have it at, at one of the protests. They set up a carousel and they had each of the FERC's commissioner's heads like blown up and on top of an animal uh, on the carousel. I wasn't the ostrich, which I was pleased that I wasn't that. That didn't seem right. I think I was a horse, which I thought that was fine. I was kind of angling for elephant. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a more contentious time. 
in pipeline development. And the areas of the country that need it the most in terms of where you're seeing pipeline development happen are the areas that are exactly the most difficult to build those pipelines into, especially as you get further east and further north. More about that in just a moment. I'm sort of leading into this, but my second headline would be, whenever you talk about electricity anymore, you can't talk about electricity without talking about natural gas. And you can't go to a natural gas conference and not talk about electricity. They are basically joined at the hip at this point, which wasn't always the case. I was curious uh, several years ago, or I, I just within this year, I was, I was curious what, what the generation profile uh, across the country was when I first started office, when I was a little baby regulator in, in 2001 and just been elected to the North Dakota Commission versus what the generation profile is today now 15 years later, in terms of where we get our electricity from. So in 2001, if you looked at the annual data, uh, natural gas, as a percentage of production of electricity, was only about a third of what coal was, only about a third. In the intervening years, for the first time in April, natural gas generation actually surpassed coal for the first time. They're about even now, but it's about 35% nationwide coming from natural gas, just about 34% coming from coal, uh, about 20% from nuclear. If you look at those three forms of basically baseload power, that's 90% of the, the generation in the country. Um, renewables, which I'm very supportive of, and I cited a lot of renewables, are still a fairly small portion of where we get our electricity from. Uh, if you take out the largest renewable is large-scale hydro, which we're not probably developing any real big large hydro projects anytime in the near future just because of a whole lot of reasons, a lot of them dealing with the difficulty of citing that from an environmental standpoint. Uh, then you get down to the sub-slice of utility scale solar and wind, which a lot of people talk about, and it's great, and the growth rate has been large in it, but in terms of the total amount that it produces on the grid is actually still quite small. Um, as I said, in order to make this all work, you eventually need pipelines. Uh, two of the slides that I was going to show that I don't have with you, but I'll sort of walk through them, uh, were really intriguing to me. I, for the longest time, I would have thought, and I testified in front of Congress on this very point about 18 months ago, that given the amount of natural gas that we've seen flood into the, the market, that we would have seen a huge increase in the amount of uh, throughput and in the amount of pipeline that is seeking to be permitted at FERC. But it Every year I'd check the stats, and every year it actually looked about the same. We were citing about 900 miles of pipe and about 15 BCF per day increase in, in throughput. That was the number of pending applications, and it wasn't changing at all. And it was very odd to me, and so I'd ask staff, and I'd say, well, what's going on here? I'd have all this gas, what's happening? And they'd say, well, what's happening is all these projects that used to be spread around the country, everybody's just investing in a few shale basins now. So all the, the dollars are just flowing to specific areas. So I thought, okay, that makes some sense, but still it would seem like we'd have an increase. Something really interesting has happened in the last year. I think what was probably happening is we had a lot of underutilized pipe. We had pipe that was, utilities were making a little bit of a tweak here or there and they'd reverse a line and they'd do something. And so they were able to make it work with the amount that was coming online. In this last year, that number has just grown exponentially. What we now have is uh, at the latest stats that I looked at, you had about 30 F, 38 BCF per day pending applications at FERC, so just about more than a doubling of what we'd had the prior year. 2,500 miles of pipe are now, seed, are now in FERC siting applications. So we're starting to see the impact of all of this gas that's, uh, that's out there. So why is this infrastructure so important? The reason is because you cannot make any sort of energy transition and do it affordably or reliably if you don't have the infrastructure in place before you start to make that transition. And this has been proven out everywhere that they've tried to make some sort of transition like this. Look at Germany. Uh, German economy, you had primarily a coal-based fleet, some nuclear, a smaller portion of wind. Over a very rapid amount of, quick amount of time, the German government decided we're not doing coal anymore. So they systematically shut off the coal plants that were there. It's about that same time that they were going through that energy transition that Fukushima happened, and nuclear was always a politically a difficult fit 
for the German people. It was never particularly popular there. Fukushima happens, and the politics of that really went over the board. And so the German government said, we're getting rid of all our nukes, too. So got rid of coal, got rid of nukes, and they depended almost exclusively on trying to do it through very subsidized renewables, very subsidized, feed, heavy, uh, su heavily subsidized feed-in tariffs. What's happened to German electricity prices, they're now about triple what they are here in the U.S., both industrial and retail. And some, in a place like North Dakota, they'd be about triple. They're now second highest in Europe. They had some of the most affordable. It's been very difficult on German industry. Actually, the only country that has higher electric rates in Europe is Denmark. But the reason for that is that they're very closely aligned with Germany. Denmark has put out a huge amount of wind, but guess what was backing up Danish wind? German coal. As the coal goes offline, it's had a dramatic increase on Danish power prices as well. They're just a little bit more expensive than Germany. But you don't have to go overseas to, to see this happen. Uh, you can look here in the U.S. Take New England. Uh, New England is a part of the country that made a rapid energy transition, shut off a lot of coal plants. Now, a lot of their coal was coal that was probably going to shut off anyway, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it was older coal units, was not as environmentally controlled as what we have here on the Great Plains. Gas was cheap, and so they were probably going to shut it off anyway. Uh, but heavy renewable portfolio mandates, heavy subsidies in an area that's not a resource-rich part of the country, but didn't have the pipelines in place, didn't have the transmission lines in place to deal with it. If you look at most rate surveys, New England, their prices for residential and industrial are about two to two and a half times what we pay here in North Dakota. California, very similar situation. There was a big spread in the New York Times over the weekend on, look at what California's doing, it's wonderful. Uh, California rates, similar transition, two, two and a half times more expensive than it is here in, in North Dakota. Now, the New York Times said this weekend is, but you know, California has invested so much in energy efficiency that they're not, it's not being shown on all their bills. That doesn't really exactly tell the whole story. The main reason for that driver is in California, at least where a lot of people live, if you're right on the coast, you just open your windows. 365 days a year in the cool ocean breezes, cool your home in the summer and heat your home in the winter. Uh, if you're one of the poor folks who live inland in California where you're dealing with 100 degree summers for days on end, those people are feeling the pinch. They have very very high utility bills. And for agriculture and industry and any of the heavily energy intensive industries within those states, they're simply fleeing the states. The reason that they've been able to make it through, honestly, is because a lot of what drives their economy tends to be not very energy intensive industries. It's biomedical research and financial firms and, and uh, uh, financial traders and higher education institutions and things like that when you think about New England and in California. It's not like the Great Plains where we have a lot of heavily energy dependent industries like production agriculture and energy manufacturing that, uh, that we depend on to drive our economy. Headline number three, the 111D regulatory train wreck is here and the cars keep piling up. Uh, one of our mantras should be, and I hope the court listens to this, at some point is this. We do not want a MATS scenario to play out in 111D. Now, what do I mean by that? MATS was the mercury and air toxic standard rule that the EPA promulgated about 2011, 2012. EPA, when it was promulgating that, it's the PowerPoint's still out on their website. I thought it was interesting. Uh, they were predicting about four gigawatts of coal shutdown due to MATS. Uh, they were close. They only missed it by a factor of 12. It ended up being about 60 gigawatts, the energy EIA, which is a very respected um, energy research for wing of the Department of Energy, in about two years after that prediction rolled out and said it was 60 gigawatts. Um, utilities were forced, forced to retire plants, put millions of dollars, billions of dollars into environmental retrofits to meet mercury and air toxic standards, change the generation of their fleet to meet this rule. As they're doing all this, the rule is getting appealed. What happens years after that rule is, is put into place? Ends up at the Supreme Court, Supreme Court overturns it, says it was an illegally promulgated rule, and now you've just spent all of these ratepayer dollars on a rule that was never legal in the first place. At the same time that that's happening, some of these same assets that we had in our coal fleet that had environmental retrofits put on them so it could extend the useful life of them now have to deal with 111D regulation. Lots of us in this space we're talking about, we need to avoid 
the train wreck that could be coming with, and the train wreck was referring to all of these regulations piling up end on end on end on end that you couldn't plan for as a regulator or as a utility, this is what the train wreck looks like, is when you have that sort of string, and I'm worried that that is um, continuing. 111D regulations put FERC, put state regulatory commissions, put state health departments, environmental regulators, their governors, state legislators in a very, very interesting spot, which is this. The rule is not ours, right? It's promulgated under the Clean Air Act by the EPA. And yet all of the potential negative outcomes, whether it be something that happens with affordability, whether it be something that happens with reliability, are all squarely in our wheelhouse. If something happens with affordability and reliability, those angry constituents are not gonna be calling up EPA. They're gonna be calling up governors, legislators, public service commissions, FERC. It'll be Congress that are hauling us in asking about what went wrong, not EPA. So we have to deal with it, whether, whether we want the fight or not, the fight seems to, to want us. So we've been knee deep in it. Timing is gonna be really key in terms of any ability to meet this plan in some sort of, I won't say affordable way, because I don't know if there's an affordable way to meet the plan. I think there's expensive compliance options and there are really expensive compliance options. And so all we're trying to do is get folks steered towards the less expensive of the two expensive ways or many expensive ways that you might comply with it. One of the ways that would make it easier to comply, and I think actually everyone even in the utility industry has acknowledged this, is if you just get the timing right, you can probably make a transition in a way that makes rational economic sense because it's a lot of the way that the technology was moving anyway. Remember that the U.S. has reduced its carbon intensity by a great amount. Over the, we have the lowest carbon emissions that we've had in, in decades right now because of just what's been going on in, through private sector investment and, uh, and through the incentives that have been in place. Uh, but the timeline is so important because it again gets back to infrastructure. Remember what I said, you have to have the infrastructure in place to make this transition work. Uh, it's pretty clear what it takes in terms of a timeline for pipelines to be developed. Pipelines take three to five years from conception to planning to engineering to design to siting to in use. Three to five years is probably a pretty average time frame for that. Uh, it's all regulated through one regulator at FERC, so we can do a little bit faster than some transmission lines coming together, but it's a still it's a fairly time-consuming process. Transmission lines, five to 12 years is probably a good estimate on those. Heaven forbid you are crossing any federal land, especially out west, 12 years you probably aren't gonna get it done in. 15 years is a, is a, is a better uh, projection on what it'll probably take for that type of uh, moving power across the West. Now remember what the Clean Power Plan 111D regulations timeline is. State plans aren't even gonna be in place until 2018. Compliance targets start in 2022. That's a four year time frame between the two. That's gonna be a real challenge for project developers, for regulators, to get that sort of investment done in time to meet the dictates of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, I've sometimes thought that if, if <laughs> If the EPA would give Bismarck the same deal that the rest of the administration seems to be negotiating with Beijing, we could meet these targets actually pretty easily because if you're paying attention to the climate accords that are going on internationally, it looks like the Chinese will get to go so far as to, they don't even peak until 2030. Here in the US, we've been declining for years and years and years. They're not even projected to peak until that time frame. We could just keep doing what we're doing over an extended amount of time and we could probably meet most of the targets uh, that we're looking at. Um, the other thing that's clear in this, and this was talked about some earlier today, is this rule does not affect all states equally. This is a highly regional rule. The, the last map that I had that I was going to show, but you can sort of visualize it in your head, is a map of the compliance targets state by state. And the, and the darker the color is, the more difficult it is for that state to, to meet the plan, the more stringent the rule is. You could just about paint a target right over the north central part of the US in terms of stringency of compliance targets in the 111D regulations. Uh, California, they're not gonna have a problem with it. New England has very easy compliance targets to meet. It just, it just so happened that all these coal plants, they needed to go offline, were gonna go offline anyway. And so they get all the credit in the world 
for that. Here in this part of the country, didn't get credit for all the wind that was built as a hedge against carbon between 2006 and 2012, no credit for that. The coal plants that we happen to have are vintage-wise much newer than they are in some of these parts of the, the East Coast. So you have, in order to deal with the plan, you in some way probably need to strand assets and underutilize assets or retire assets that would otherwise have useful life left in them. So it's a, it's a much different rule in this part of the country. And if you look at the hardest hit states, they're almost all in this region. I, I can probably reel most of them off the top of my head. Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Illinois, Michigan, Iowa, Wisconsin. And that's probably your top 10 hardest targets to meet states all in this part of the country, and there's, it's, not a, it's not a secret. It's the way the EPA baked the cake in terms of getting to the number that they wanted to get to. Okay, so I've been kind of depressing up to this point. And, and as I was thinking about what I'd say, <laughs> I thought I can't end here because I'll never be invited back. And I love North Dakota, and I want to get invited back to, to conferences. And if I just stop there, they'll think there's no hope in, in energy. And I, it's actually far from the case. If you step back and you think about where we are in terms of a country, in terms of energy, compared to where we have been for most of the past 40 years, it's kind of amazing. It's not because of government. I think it's probably, in some cases, in spite of government. But if you step back and think about what we've all dealt with for our entire lives, I and mean, we were, all of us, convinced that this nation was absolutely destined to be dependent on Middle Eastern oil and probably Middle Eastern natural gas for the foreseeable future because we couldn't produce enough at home and we had to import all of our energy. Today, if you total up the numbers, something like three quarters of the crude oil that's produced or that's consumed in the U.S. on a daily basis is produced, most of it in the U.S., but at least on the North American continent. Natural gas, it's like 97, 98 percent, and we have more natural gas than we ever thought we'd have in the past. There, there's a chance, as long as we don't mess it up, for true American energy security that none of us for the past 40 years thought that we would have a chance to embrace and, and let alone take advantage of. So that's tremendous. As I said, from, a, from an environmental standpoint, we've actually had a much cleaner fleet than we ever thought we'd have in the past, too, because of some of the transitions that we have been able to make. And a third positive thing that I think is, is something that we're just seeing play out, but it's going to have a real impact on the grid and the operations of the grid is the technology that's now developing in terms of connecting in a smart way user end compliances and how the grid operates in such a way that we can integrate some of the technologies that we want to integrate, especially on the renewable side. And some of it's being developed right here in North Dakota. Is Paul Steffes? I saw Paul earlier. I know he's said, there he is in the back of the room. I, I told him this story. I was, I was in outside Philadelphia last week. Uh, there's a, the regional grid operator, it's actually the regional, mar the largest regional electricity market in the world is, a, uh, is called PJM. It's kind of the equivalent of MISO or SPP, but in the mid-Atlantic in Chicago and in parts of the, the Northeast. And I was at their headquarters and was taking a tour of their control room and just talking about them with things that they have going on. And I walk into the lobby and in a big display in the lobby is a Steffes Corp uh, water heater that's, that, they're, that they're showcasing and the reason that they're showcasing it is they're showing that this is an example of the type of technology that can interact with a smart grid in terms of being able to bring online things like variable energy resources, drawing power off the grid when you need power to be drawn off the grid, but then not drawing off when you don't want that demand to come on the grid and interacting in a very sophisticated way. These type of things are going to have a very positive impact moving forward. Now, do I think that all of those type of things is enough to make our electricity actually cheaper than it is today, given where 111D regulations are going? Probably not. But it does help around the edges. And for those operators and innovators, uh, there are going to be opportunities like that. I'm going to close with one quick thing, and then we should have about 15 minutes for uh, some Q&A if you all want to get into it. And it'll, it'll be with this. This is sort of talking to those of us who are in the regulatory world and our, our regulators. One of the really important things that I think we need to continue to focus in on is to stress the importance of regulatory independence and due process and the rule of law in how we cite our, our infrastructure. And for the most part, I think state commissions and I think FERC does a pretty good job of it, but there is a, there is a move to politicize 
infrastructure development in a way that there hasn't been in the past, as I talked about before, as this infrastructure gets more difficult to site. Although FERC does not, has not had a formal role in the Keystone XL debacle, uh, the only thing that FERC would do in a case of a liquid pipeline is actually tell the pipeline what they can charge. We are an economic regulator, but we don't cite it. States cite it. The only reason the federal government, as you all know, has anything to do with KXL is because it happens to cross a, a border, an international border, so they have to apply for a permit through the State Department. I would argue that the real, the real victim in the KXL debacle is the rule of law. The problem there is whether you're for Keystone XL, whether you're adamantly opposed to Keystone XL, I would think we could all agree that a project developer deserves an answer in less than seven years. Right? Because the way the rule of law works is the decision maker, in this case the State Department, has to make a decision on the record, hopefully make a decision in a timely manner, and then if you agree with the decision or not, you can take that decision to court and somewhere a federal judge looks at the record and says, that decision maker, maker made a decision that was not arbitrary and capricious. So you have a check, you have a balance. But if the decision maker just simply doesn't make a decision at all, what you're circumventing is due process and the rule of law. The problem is we know what's going to happen with infrastructure development in this country in just about any scenario, whether it's transmission lines or pipelines, there will probably be more investment in it. If the new rule is that projects can be held up just because someone wants to politicize it and you don't get an answer on it at all, so what happens when there's the project that someone else wants that hooks up a wind farm? Someone says, no, I'm going to use a process to, to block that line. What about this pipeline? I'm going to use a process to block that. Once that rule of law breaks down and you lose the independence of the regulator in making a decision that's based on a record and is reviewed by a court, then you have the risk of stopping all infrastructure development from happening. As I said, that's the disaster scenario, trying to move to some other system before we have the infrastructure in place to deal with it. With that, I'll close up my comments, but as I said, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. lulled you all to sleep. I knew this would be a challenging time slot. I mean, it's right after lunch, big piece of lasagna. We have one that was texted in. Okay, great. What does FERC think about the reliability safety valve the EPA included in the final clean power plan? It's not practical to keep a base load plant idled unless needed. Yeah, so FERC held a series of technical conferences in the lead up to, after the draft rule was out, but before the final rule came out. And FERC, in our comments that we compiled coming out of those technical conferences and submitted to EPA, basically said three things. Number one, in the draft rule, we think you got the timing wrong. There was not enough timing provided, uh, enough time provided for the utilities to meet the compliance targets that you were looking at. EPA pushed that timeline back by two years. It's good as far as it goes. I would have argued that it should have been a lot longer. As I said in my speech, I think that the timeline should have been driven by a, realist, a realistic assessment of how long it takes infrastructure to get constructed. Um, two years is better than nothing, but it's still a very aggressive timeline. Second thing we asked for, I'll get to the safety valve in just a moment, but the second thing we asked for was something that came to be known as the reliability assurance mechanism. EPA didn't adopt that in so many words, um, but there are some undertones of it in the final rule. Basically the idea was we said, Somebody, whoever it is, has to look at all these state plans that are coming together, almost like a quilt, and make sure that the quilt matches up, because state A could be doing something that state B doesn't know about, and the two don't fit together, but the grid doesn't operate on a state-by-state -state basis. The grid operates agnostic of state lines. So someone who has an expertise in engineering and markets has to take a look at how it all fits together. Uh, there's some notion of that concept where the the the, the entity that submits the state implementation plan will have to certify that they've talked to somebody about some of these reliability issues. It'll probably be some combination of the NERC regional entity or MISO in this region or your state public service commission, something like that. And FERC is available to help provide some of that data the, and analysis. The, the third issue was this thing that came to be called, known as the RSV, Reliability Safety Valve. And the idea here was it's sort of like the it's like the, the button you could hit that would have the off-ramp in case you got into the operating year and you realize that a plant you thought you didn't need, you actually do need to keep the grid up and running. This was modeled after 
or Matt's experience, again, that rule is, that has been invalidated, where there actually was bolted onto that plan a reliability safety valve that was used a few times in which a, if a utility was seeking extra time for compliance, they could, they could apply to EPA for that, and EPA, through an MOU, said they would turn over that request to FERC, and FERC would sort of certify independently whether the engineering analysis that the utility has done has done it correctly and that, yes, indeed, that plant needs to stay online. It was utilized a couple of times, and so the concept is maybe we could apply this to the Clean Power Plan uh, 111D, and it is in there. I don't know how likely it is that it'll be used, however, because it's, this is a very different rule than Matt's. I mean, Matt's was focusing in on very discrete, specific plants, and you knew where they were, and you could analyze and model those specific plants. 111D is a, this is a carbon energy resource plan for the entire grid. And so there's so many moving parts to it that it's, well, I'm glad the safety valve is in there. I'm not sure that it's a perfect fit with this particular rule, and I don't know if it'll be ultimately used. Oh, there's one in the back of the room. Hi. Hi, All right, good to see you. You too, Jeremy, Dr. Expansion hey, Energy. Jeremy. Uh, so I, one of the things that will allow the industry to meet these clean power plan requirements will be if we can have a whole lot more power storage on the grid to absorb the intermittent wind and solar, et cetera, convert that into firm power, keep the grid reliable. One of the things that has been a challenge, though, to develop projects, storage projects, is that it's difficult to monetize them because they have a lot of benefits to the system, uh, everything from firming up the renewables to avoiding transmission and distribution upgrades, system reliability, frequency regulation, et cetera. It's difficult, though, for one asset owner to capture the value all, of all of that and avoid the free rider phenomenon. So what would you say from your standpoint as a FERC commissioner uh, should be some policy uh, changes at the federal level and maybe more importantly at the state level to incentivize storage to actually get built? Yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, energy storage to me, there's... Everybody talks about game changer. This is a game changer. That's a game changer. This, in my mind, the, the two big game changers that we've seen, number one is shale gas, number two is the potential for energy storage. The challenge with energy storage is that on a large scale, it's, we're still at the potential standpoint, or at, at the potential um, phase of things. There are some great demonstration projects, and there's getting to be larger projects that can be plugged into the grid. And you're right, if you can get economical storage on the grid. It takes so many of the problems that we have with variable energy resources away. I mean, that's, that's the challenge with wind, right? You, if you're replacing a 500 megawatt coal plant, you don't just go out and get 500 megawatts of wind. You have to get 1,500 megawatts of wind and maybe a gas plant to help back it up. It's not a one-for-one -one sort of scenario. If you can firm back up Intermittent resources, it really does change the game in terms of how grid planners look at it. Part of it's economics and technology that is outside of government's control. That's going to have to happen in the private sector, and there's a lot of incentive for somebody to get that answered right because the person who invents it is going to do very well. Um, but there are things the government can do. FERC has been looking at a number of ways, and we've promulgated a number of rules just recently, and I think they may be in line for some tweaks as we see uh, how they work in terms of ensuring that new technologies like energy storage have the ability to play in FERC jurisdictional markets, basically. So it's a recognition of things like fast ramping capabilities, like you said, frequency regulation, and being able to gather the value of that in real time in the markets. I think we've made some strides in that. There's probably, as we get more experience with the things that we're going to learn along the way, though. One specific follow-up question, though. Yeah. Um, typically, in a lot of parts of the country, utilities are prevented from owning anything that looks like a generation asset. And a lot of times, regulators will look at storage as a generation asset. So therefore, the utility, who's sometimes the, the natural owner who could monetize all of those values of storage, is prevented from owning it. So would you have any policy recommendations to maybe think, rethink policy on storage and have a separate category separating it from generation? Yeah, it's... 
you're right, and, and to the degree that it's in a large part, that question is going to be asked, answered state by state because it depends on that, that structural decision that I talked about that states get to make about how their utilities are, are structured. If you are from a part of the country like North Dakota where it is still an integrated resource planned system, in other words, you have a vertically integrated utility that working with their state regulator comes up with a plan for how they're going to provide power, even if they're operating within a, an organized market, you have some ability to build some of that into the grid. It's a, it's a different challenge in parts of the country where states have basically given up the ghost on generation regulation. Uh, if you're in New England, they've, for example, one uh, area or Texas or, or other uh, places that have restructured, the state has given up their authority over picking which generation resource gets selected for that area. Although the this is a totally separate speech, but 111D regulation is probably, in my mind, going to, it doesn't require, but the political reality is a lot of states are probably going to backtrack on restructuring and are going to have to, in some way, almost some soft form of re-regulation of those assets that had previously been spun off. Um, but in those parts of the country, it's a very different question. That is where, I think, FERC policy plays a bigger role in terms of ensuring that those resources have access to the markets. Uh, but to the degree that even given FERC access to the markets, they're not making it financially. Some of those states may decide on their own to decide out-of-market solutions to it. Thanks. Got like five minutes if anybody has a question. If not. Okay, one more from the text. Without a court stay on the CPP rule, how is the MATS scenario to be avoided if states and utilities must prepare for compliance? I don't know that there is a way that you can avoid it unless the courts come in and sort of take care of it. Uh, EPA on its own could choose to do it, but I think it's pretty clear that they have indicated they will not stay their own rule until court challenges are done. Congress has attempted to pass legislation that would do just that and allow an off-ramp or some sort of period where while the litigation is taking place, the rule does not go into effect. Uh, but even if Congress could pass it, you're going to, in all likelihood, see a presidential veto of that. And you're not going to see an override of the veto. So you are left with the courts to, to do it. Maybe there's more hope here, because we have just lived through the math scenario. And it would seem like that's a pretty powerful piece of evidence that you can give a judge to say, look what we just went through with this rule. Billions of dollars spent in assets to meet a rule that's now not even wasn't legally promulgated. Uh, there's a track record there now, so maybe a, a judge would take a look at it and say, you know what, given the greater scheme of things, there's really no harm in putting this rule on ice until we have the court challenges settled because there will be significant court challenges. EPA is, is I mean, Attorney General Stenjum mentioned earlier, has never promulgated something like this. This is, a, this is a very different rule than anything that they've done before, and there's a lot of avenues for legal attack. Interesting thing, I just read an article not long ago, where they surveyed a number of attorneys and they said, do you think the 111D regs as EPA has promulgated will be overturned? And it ended up being 50-50 uh, in terms of predictions on whether it would be upheld or not. The interesting thing was if you, if you separated out the types of attorneys who were answering that survey, attorneys who were in private practice overwhelmingly thought that it would be reversed. Law professors overwhelmingly thought that it would be upheld. If there are no more questions, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you today. Um, I tell you what, I'm a little bit uh, surprised to be moderating the panel. So I was driving over here today, I heard a uh, radio talk show host say the utilities hire no one but people who are, let's see, not progressive enough to talk to people outside the coal industry and not smart enough to think outside the box. So. That's, uh, I'm glad to be here anyway, so that's good. Um, after hearing that, I was reminded of something I was told by a prominent uh, politician in North Dakota. He said, well, Dale, just remember, nothing is impossible for the person who doesn't have to do it. So we'll keep that in mind as we're going. With that, I think it's going to be a, a good panel. It's a little bit depressing with everything going on with the Clean Power Act and oil prices the way they are, but we're going to be here to give you a little bit of hope 
and an idea of what people are working on for the future to try and move the, move the state forward and move the industry forward. First to start off, we're going to have Mike Jones. Mike Jones is a PhD and is a Vice President of Research and Development for the League Night Energy Council. He's got over 25 years in the industry, has been a senior research advisor at the Energy, Environment, and Research Center. He's an adjunct professor of physics at UND and a graduate of Bemidji State University. He earned a master's degree and a doctorate in physics from UND and has also co-authored over 80 publications. So with that, help me welcome Mike Jones. Thank you, Dale. Ah, there we go. And thank you for the opportunity to, to be with the group here today. As Dale said, appreciate the fact that you are hanging around and, and sticking with us to the bitter end. Uh, just as a word of warning, uh, about a week and a half ago, I had the pleasure of participating in my daughter's wedding. And one of the things that you do, of course, is the father of the bride always gets to speak and my wife gave me a couple rules. She said, you can't say energy, you can't use PowerPoints, and no equations. <laughs> so you guys get them. When we talk about, the, the discussion was to, to focus on the innovation, the renaissance in our industry. And I think that there's a lot of things happening right now. And, and let me just share a little bit about that. We've gone through a fairly significant activity I think all of you know the, the Lignite Energy Council is a trade association that represents the Lignite industry here in our fair state of North Dakota and the region surrounding it. And we've talked for some years about the real challenges that we see. We've talked a lot about the clean power plan today, and that's really the culmination of a series of challenges that we've been focused on for some period of time. And so it's not a new thing that we're looking at innovation. And I think that when we talked about that, it was clear that R&D, and that's really where my, my hope and my love is, is in the research and development area, has to be a key part of our future if we're going to be successful. And to do that, we talked about what is it that we should be looking at right now, and we really focus on the truly innovative things that we can do, both as an industry and as a state. And I'd like to say right now, we've heard a lot about the success our state has seen and how the legislature has been a key part of that. And we have to say the same thing because, you know, the research and development activities that are part of our industry are really something that's been focused on by our legislature. And they've been willing to work with us to make that a reality. And knowing the challenges that we do see right now, just last year, they were able to be very supportive and actually awarded us significant additional funds to focus on these innovative things that we see going forward. So we've talked about innovation, we've talked about partnerships, because as we look at what we're talking about in our industry, when you talk about a new technology for the lignite industry, we're not talking about a couple million dollars or even tens of millions of dollars, it's hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And so we need the partnerships, we need other like-minded individuals, and we need a state that's supportive of us and that's all happened. We've all seen all of those things already. The, the, the membership knew there was challenges, and so they've committed additional resources themselves, and we've been able to work with the state to get additional from them as well. And many people, such as myself, spend your whole career in the R&D side, and you look at where can you make a difference. And this is one of the few times when I had a whole series of CEOs of the industry sitting around the table and said, look at me and said, Mike, what can we do now? Where are we going to go? So it's a very exciting time for us going forward. So the two key challenges that we see right now are really how do we preserve the existing fleet? As you know, we've got a tremendous investment. It's in the bin, tens of billions of dollars worth of infrastructure in North Dakota today. And then second part is how do we prepare for the future? And what we know today is that what we've done in the past isn't going to be acceptable. We're going to have to do better. And so how do we do that? And one of the things that we've really focused on, what I'd like to talk about today, is something we call the alum cycle. And this is a totally innovative way that we think we can transform how we make use of our lignite resources here in the state of North Dakota. As I said to start out with, the Lignite Council says we need to focus on transformational technology. In other words, if I improve it by one or 2%, that's not good enough. We have to change the paradigm, and this is one of those opportunities. 
We believe this is our top candidate from what we see today. And it's a group called Eight Rivers Capital. It's a development group out of the Carolinas that holds the rights to this, and they're working forward with it right now. We're interested in making use of this with Lignite. They already are funding, and we'll have a demonstration operational on natural gas in Texas late next year. And that's expected to be what we hope will be the first step in the path towards making this a reality with Lignite Coal. So what is this system? Well, if you look at it, we talk about it's oxy-fired. What does that mean? Normally in, a, in a, uh, a boiler where you use Lignite, you're taking air, feeding it with the fuel, you combust that and release the energy. In this case, we're using pure oxygen instead of air. We're eliminating that dilutant, which is nitrogen, that goes into it. But the real innovation in this is that if you look at the boilers we have in North Dakota today, steam is usually what we call the working fluid. That's what's used to take that energy, chemical energy that's stored in the coal, transfer it, in this case, into electrons, basically, as a means of transferring that energy around the system. When we talk about changing this, we're going to use supercritical CO2 as the working fluid. So if you talk about a, a standard gas turbine, and if you know what happens in a gas turbine, you burn that, you get it up to a high temperature, and you push it through a turbine, turns the blades, and that's where your electrons are going to come from. Well, we're going to push those blades with supercritical CO2 in this case. And so what's really unique, it's going to be very high temperature and high pressure. When I say high temperature and high pressure, we expect the combustor to operate at 4,000 PSI. Normally what we're talking about today is atmospheric pressure, unless you're looking at a combined cycle system at pressure. And we're going to operate then with uh, both high temperatures and pressure. And the, the stream that's going to leave that combustor is basically going to be CO2 and water. We can knock out the water and we're going to have a pure CO2 stream. So what that talks about then is we've got a chance now. You heard a lot about the challenges that we see with the clean power plan, and that is that they're asking us to do very significantly different things in terms of the footprint with respect to CO2. And I've talked about this at different meetings. I know you've probably heard it from other people. One of the real challenges with when you look at capturing CO2 today, it's very expensive, both in terms of the capital and operating, and also parasitic load, in other words, power loss. We talk about a 33% loss in power with a lot of the conventional CO2 capture schemes today and very high costs. You know, if we look at the generation we're talking about today, I've seen estimates anywhere from $50 to $100 a ton for capturing that CO2. So how do we change that paradigm? Well, this is just a Bach diagram, and I promise there won't be a test later on, so you don't have to go through the whole thing. But what I want to show you here is that little colored box is where we have something which is really new. And that's where the alum cycle is. Before that, we're talking about a gasification system and gas cleaning. These are things we have done already. So there in that box is where the challenge is. And now what's the big challenge? Well, I mentioned to you already, we're talking about something that's going to operate at 4,000 PSI, very high pressure. And temperature is probably in the range of 24 to 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to have some significant materials issues that we have to deal with as we design in these new, new items that we're going to be using in this system. Now, why are we interested in this? Well, I think this tells the whole story right here. With this type of a system, you go out to the, the boilers we have out in the, the coal fields of, in North Dakota here, and we're looking at something which probably is going to be on the range of 32, 34% efficient. That's the amount of chemical energy which turns into the electrical energy you talk about. If we go into a combined cycle system, or the combined heat and power like they're doing at Spiritwood, we can change that significantly. Spiritwood now operates at about 60% efficiency with a full load thermal load. But what we're talking about here is with coal, we think we're going to be close to 50% efficient, plus we're capturing all of the CO2. So why haven't we got this already? Well, we've got a whole series of questions. That's our challenge right now. This is a concept which we think links a whole series of things that we currently are able to do, but we've never put them together in a single box before. And that's why we're going through the demonstrations that we're talking about right now. And then if you want to 
as Dale said to me just a little while ago, there's been a lot of gloom and doom about the clean power. Well, I think there is some hope in some of these things that we are looking at. Not only are we going to be able to capture all of the CO2 with this system, and I'm not talking about 50 or 70 or 90%. I'm talking about 100% capture is very possible with this. We're looking at if you're able to sell that CO2, and here's where a marriage of the coal industry with the oil and gas industry is a critical thing to happen in the future, we hope. We're able to talk about at $20 a ton, a cost of approximately five cents a kW. Now, if you're in the power business right now and somebody tells you they can build a greenfield plant with five cent power coming out of it, they just want to know where they can sign up. So the reason we aren't signing them up is we're still in that phase. We're, this is the, our hope, this is one of the things that we're looking at that we think has that opportunity to totally change the paradigm with respect to lignite. Now in North Dakota, that's gonna be especially interesting because as I said, we see our future tied very closely with the oil and gas industry. We're both fossil fuel, we both have some of the same types of challenges in terms of regulatory issues. And we're also in North Dakota, you heard about some of the development that's been going on, the fact we're producing well over a million barrels a day. But if you look at the Bakken, and it wasn't really discussed, but depending upon who you talk to, I hear the estimates that we're talking about three, maybe to 6% of the oil in place is what we're able to get with fracking. What I see that leaves a target of 95% still on the ground. What we want to understand is what can we do with supercritical CO2 in terms of enhanced oil recovery to really extend and, and make for a much larger opportunity in the state longer term. So I guess from my perspective, here's where we are today. And I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. We've gone through an early phase study working with uh, our industrial partners. In this case, it's Elite which is the parent company of BNI Coal and Minnesota Power and Basin Electric, both two companies I think you're all very familiar with. Uh, they were willing to put money in. We got some funding through our Lignite Research Program, which again, we thank the legislature for making this available to us to try to work through some of these challenges that we see. And what the question was asked is, what can we do with Lignite? Does it fit this box, basically, is what the question was. We worked with the Electric Power Research Institute, and if you're familiar with that group, they are kind of the laboratory, if you will, for the power industry. Uh, they came back and said, yes, but here's our questions. And so now we're trying to work through those questions. And it really comes down to materials issues and also what we call as a recuperator or a heat exchanger, which is going to have to operate under very extreme conditions. We're working through what we call phase two, which is where we answer some of those questions. Moving then into phase three, which would be a demonstration and finally a commercial opportunity. Now the challenge that I see is, this is not something that's gonna happen. This is not the computer industry. We don't have new technology in a year. Our schedule right now is we hope we'd be able to be at a stage of talking about that first commercial demonstration about the middle of the next decade, mid 20s. But I think that's aggressive and I think that's very doable. So what are the next steps? I think right now, if you're not familiar with it, in, in addition to the hat I wear as the Vice President for R&D for the Lignite Energy Council, I'm also the technical advisor to what's called the Lignite Research Program. So I'm an advisor to the Industrial Commission on issues related to that, that set of topics. We have a, twice a year we ask for proposals. This last one included one from the team that I just mentioned to you. What we've done is we brought in the EERC. I think most of you are familiar with the EERC, world-class, research and development group here in North Dakota, that if you want to know the truth, their specialty is lignite. They are the world's best laboratory, in my opinion, on lignite. So we brought them in to help us through some of these issues. I have a proposal for them that will be evaluated. If you're bored on the 17th of November, want to come to a lignite research council, I mean, you're going to hear what we're going to be doing that day. And I hope where we're going to be able to go once we've gone through the review process. In addition, we've been working with the National Energy Technology Laboratory. This is the part of the, the Department of Energy which focuses on the fossil issues. This is the group that said, I think it was quoted earlier, that we're looking at that next generation of capture technologies will be available about 2025. Out of sync with what EPA is asking it to do, but those are not, that's another issue. The other group that we're working with is the Canadian Clean Power Coalition. There's a group up in Canada, and this is where we've been trying to leverage our work in the, in the R&D side with coal. 
They are focused on the Canadian assets and how that allows coal to remain in their mix for the future. We're looking at the U.S. mainly, but we're sharing information on things that we do, and there's definitely an interest in trying to work together on things like this. So with that, just a couple final thoughts. You know, we need to protect the existing industry. We've got a, we we're estimating something on the order of a $20 billion investment. We cannot afford to have that stranded. That's not in the best interest of the residents of North Dakota in this region for the long-term viability uh, of our economy. Partnership with oil and gas, I think, is a critical thing. I think that's a way that we can manage this issue with respect to CO2 in a way which isn't going to be totally a lost cause and just a, a deficit on the books. And then finally, I really do believe that if you talk about where we are as a society, we've been based on carbon forever. Lignite is the cheapest source of carbon that we do have. We will use it. Let's just make sure we use it wisely and do that for the future. So with that, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Great. Let's have us think, Mike. Thanks, Mike. The format we'll go through, we'll have each person present for about oh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions at the end. Our next presenter we're happy to have here as well is Paul Steffes. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman for Steffes Corporation, which is a design, build, sell, steel fabrication company for the energy and industrial markets, and the only North American manufacturer of grid interactive electrical thermal storage, space, and water heating units. Paul has won many local and national awards, including North Dakota Small Business Person of the Year, awarded by the Federal Small Business Administration. If you want to look up in the dictionary for the word entrepreneur, Paul Steffes' photo will be beside that. He's long been involved in industry and really a, a forward thinker. We're glad to have him here. Please welcome Paul. Thank you, Dale. <clears throat> um, I, uh, you know, I like to think in terms of, I've always you know, used the word that we have to reinvent ourselves every five years to, uh, to, to, stay, to stay alive because the cheese is always moving. We've modified that to, you know, now we're just into continuous reinvention, which is really, because it doesn't come in lots, you just kind of have to continually work on it. I will point out one thing too, Dale. It's like, at Steffes, we do the difficulty immediately, but I wanted to point out to you that the seemingly impossible we attack as well, it just takes a little bit longer. So, so we, we handle the impossible too, Dale. So just to, you know, give you just a, a second or two on uh, the history of Steffes. Uh, you know, my father was uh, my, my uh, inventive father. Certainly, I've, you know, that was my biological father was my engineering father. Uh, he was a third grade graduate. He, uh, you know, had a farm near Mohall, and uh, he could just make things out of wood and steel, just a, you know, anything, and he'd make something out of it. And uh, luckily, uh, you know, he passed that on to me I have other, you know, fathers, which include Base and Electric and the EERC, actually. Uh, you know, when we were transmission, you know, transitioning from a blacksmith shop uh, in 1988 after, after 15 years of, uh, you know, uh, I had a degree in mechanical engineering, came back, and we had a lathe and a welder because my father had retired from his businesses. And uh, we were just doing a little bit of everything. So 15 years later, we had 10 employees. Uh, we had no debt. Uh, the economic development group at Base and Electric, uh, you know, gave us a tip that there might be some electric thermal storage needed. Uh, the EERC helped us with some um, ceramic knowledge so we could start manufacturing very, very dense brick. And uh, we started making devices. You can, you can see some of them uh, in the, on the slide. The, you know, the one that is open is like a 3,000 pounds of bricks, very, very dense brick, this continent's densest brick. And we simply heated up with off-peak electricity from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. And, uh, but it would keep the home warm all day long. And uh, we have about 100,000 homes in the U.S. and Canada that heat with this type of a system. And it was a simplistic system. You could have a time clock, a, a single load control signal, and uh, you'd simply draw electricity from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. Uh, you know, certainly maybe... 10 years ago, we started seeing the handwriting on the wall that standard electric resistance anything was not going to be in favor, uh, you know, with any environmental group. Uh, there were building codes that were closing in on uh, anything electric resistance. So we knew we needed to uh, do some reinvention in this particular industry. 
So what we did was uh, we, we started working on telemetry so that our ceramic devices and the electric resistance water heater, we put telemetry to them so that we could, we could take them and change their charge rate every few seconds. And uh, you know, we certainly needed to have verification, so we had uh, you know, revenue-grade metering on every one of these devices. And we had telemetry, and we were able to aggregate these devices so that, yes, they're distributed, but they became a grid-scale battery. You can think of uh, our, our assets. You know, we currently have an 8 gigawatt battery, 8 gigawatt hour battery out there that's ready to serve the grid in many different ways, you know, on a distributed basis or on local feeders or individual homes. And so um, we were able to take this technology that was basically falling out of favor to something that can you know, make significant dollars for electric utilities and, uh, and it can serve, you know, we suddenly got the environmental community to support it as well because you know, we in effect can become that cost effective, fast responsive battery that can do the second to second you know, real time up and down regulations of the grid and it can also serve as a tool to uh, integrate much higher percentages of renewable energy. Uh, you know, so, so it becomes this uh, piece that uh, I, I heard earlier, you know, people using, uh, you know, the, you know the, the holy grail or, you know, one, one of the game changers is energy storage. And, uh, you know, this is something that can provide that cost-effective piece. We, we certainly uh, had Sandia National Lab in um, New Mexico look at this innovation. And, uh, you know, they, you can go to the Sandia National Lab website today, download free software called ES Select. And uh, it'll list all of the energy storage technologies, and it certainly shows that this type of technology, this form of energy storage, is less than 10% of the cost of energy, other you know, means of storing energy. And uh, it was the only one with a calcular, calculable payback at this point in time as well. So it, it was a, a really nice piece, and we continue to advance uh, you know, this particular technology as well. So, um, uh, you know, one of our you know, hot spots is, uh, you know, certainly in Minnesota, we heat 20,000 homes. We heat 14,000 homes in Nova Scotia. Uh, the Hawaii is one of our, our bleeding edges uh, or our, our, our latest, you know, frontiers, and that you can think of every Hawaiian island as a microgrid, if you will, and uh, you don't have the transmission to uh, distribute the energy off the island, and so, um, you know, the midday generation with solar is, is getting to be an acute problem. And so with these flexible water heaters where we can get them to consume energy individually and collectively in real time to suck up that midday solar, it's become a very provocative situation. One additional benefit that you get with having this particular type of telemetry on a water heater is that not only are you serving the real time needs of the grid, you're also ensuring that individual consumers don't run out of hot water. So it, it helps the consumer. It is truly this win, win, win all the way around. You know, just to talk in terms of other innovations, you know, we're, we, we do lots of different things. Uh, just being an innovative group and uh, being in uh, North Dakota and with all of the oil activity going on, we, uh, we started making everything for the oil site except for the pump. And, uh, you know, so... So, you know, you know, the technology to separate the oil, the treaters that separate the natural gas from the salt water and the oil, you know, that was something that we got involved in. And, uh, you know, to, to keep advancing the, you know, the, the technology, uh, we, we certainly had to produce x-ray quality piping to make a living, you know, selling this as well. Then we had to supply... UL electrical panels to make complete skids so that, you know, these devices can, uh, you know, go right from the factory, everything done in the factory so the cost can be very, very low, and then delivered right to the site. And today, you know, we, uh, we continue to pick up new contracts in the oil industry because we're helping oil industries keep their costs low and, uh, you know, so they can remain profitable. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we continue to uh, work with the ERC as well in that uh, we have a very innovative flaring technology 
So uh, the flaring technology was an interesting problem in that uh, to meet EPA requirements, you needed to have 98% uh, you know, combustion, and it had to be a completely smoke-free kind of uh, a burn. So we had a number of oil companies read us the, basically the design requirements or their pain, and uh, our innovative team was able to come up with a variable orifice type of, uh, uh, um, type of flare. And basically, when the waste gas comes out of the well, it doesn't come at a steady rate. It goes continually. It's fluctuating up and down and up and down. So with the variable orifice, we were able to um, naturally get the gas to come out and mix with the air at a constant speed, whether it was a low flow or a high flow. And this enabled us to get a you know, EPA-approved uh, constant you know, smoke-free burn regardless of the flow. So you know, we, we have our flares on thousands of wells in, in the Bakken, and uh, this technology has a, a way, you know, now we're selling more than half of our product in, uh, in Texas and Wyoming as well. So it, it has become uh, uh, a wonderful piece. Oil company you know, executives worked in Dickinson, got to know the product. They suddenly were transferred to Wyoming or Texas or elsewhere, and they remembered the good flair, and uh, luckily we're, we're able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And uh, so, so our future in this $45 a barrel oil is to be, you know, continue, you know, this uh, evolution of uh, improvement and, uh, you know, to continue to drive costs down in that particular arena. Um, so, you know, that along with, uh, you know, our, our, our custom manufacturing, where we have a complete shop where we laser cut parts, we design, we bend, we weld, we paint, and uh, you know we uh, we serve many many in-state and out-of-state uh, you know parts for various uh, OEM uh, you know products. So so with that uh, you know we we uh, we continue to um, to see what uh, what Tenor can bring, and and uh, we have a wonderful team of uh, you know probably 50 engineers that. Uh, are, are not afraid to try things. Um, the one comment I'll make on innovation that I feel to my soul is that it is not necessarily some wonderful genius. Innovation is 90% plus the simple willing to try something, uh, the recognition that many of the things you try will probably or possibly fail. You have to be willing to accept that failure. Uh, it doesn't mean the company fails. Um, and in every case, when we've tried something, we've learned something new that we didn't know simply because we tried it. And it, uh, it, it helped us get to our ultimate endpoint, even if it wasn't the original endpoint that we were targeting in the first place. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, right. Dale. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. <laughs> Paul, question for you. What we're seeing now, especially with, with whole house technology, we're seeing where you can, you know, turn your lights off, turn your uh, heat up and down with, a, with your cell phone. And a lot of the times we've been looking, you know, what you're doing is trying to do energy efficiency. We look at clean power plant, one of the blocks in the clean power plant is energy efficiency, but it is very tough to monitor, to monetize, and to verify. And we've been talking with some co-ops who have load management systems who are thinking of moving away from controlling just the water heater or just the air conditioning to kind of a whole house control or technology. Is that anything that you've looked at or have had any experience with? I certainly understand the question and the, the units that we have in the field typically have a one-to-one -one relationship with the Azure cloud and uh, have this ongoing relationship that doesn't slow down the home's internet. But, um, you know, certainly there is a, a, a clear need or a, a vision, one vision for the future that makes wonderful sense is that there is a gateway in every home that does have a robust pipe that can do many things, mm -hmm. and uh, our types of technologies simply could use that gateway in the home to, uh, to, to perform mm -hmm. its new level of conservation efficiency. And it isn't, it isn't the classic efficiency of a water heater in a box and its efficiency, but looking at the entire system where there is real carbon reduction, there's real dollars and cents that, uh, that bring value to, uh, to, to the environment and to consumers and to utility companies. Great. 
Thank you. Anything else right now? The other thing, Mike, in, along with all of your other jobs and responsibility, you recently got named to the Coal Council. And for those that are out here, could you just give a quick rundown of what that entails and what you'll do on the council? The National Coal Council is an advisory group to the Secretary of Energy. Uh, there's a series of councils that have been established through legislation that offer a forum for interested parties, whether it be uh, companies that are involved in the industry, uh, non-government groups, environmental groups, all of them gather twice a year and just have an agenda which is to talk about where are issues? Uh, in many cases, the secretary will request a white paper on a topic of interest. Uh, one was just done recently on the status of uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology. Those are the types of things that they would offer and advice to the uh, administration in, that, in those areas. Thank you. With that, I'd like to, to thank the panel that came here today and shared their information with us. You know, and a lot of people will, will ask, you know, now why, why do we want to look at R&D right now? Oil prices are down, heavy regulation coming up on the electric industry, but for a lot of people that you talk to, now is the perfect time to be doing that. Instead of when things are going strong and everyone's trying to scramble for dollars, scramble for people, we've got a chance now to step back and work on technology so that when things turn around, which we know they will, we're ready for that to happen. So with that, did you have something else? Okay. With that, oh, we will... I'm just going to challenge you. I think you should just go with continuous innovation and I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, we will we'll, we'll, uh, close this panel out and I'll turn it over to Emily McKay. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel, and all of our speakers today. We had a great lineup. I'm going to ask Al Anderson to come and wrap up our event for us, but I first wanted to give you a quick reminder that you'll be getting a survey via email, so when you get that, we'd love to have your feedback on today's conference um, and get your suggestions for next year, too. Then I'd like to acknowledge our wonderful planning committee and the BSC team that helped run our event this year. From Senator Hoven's office, we had Don Larson and Kristen Hammond. From Senator Heitkamp's office, Joanne Beckman. From Congressman Kramer's office, Lisa Gibbons and Chris Marole. From Governor Dalrymple's office, Jason Nisbet. From KLJ, Danelle Rorick, Kathy Fuller and Emily Johnson from North Dakota Department of Commerce, Al Anderson. And from BSC, we had Mary Morell, Carrie Knudsen, Dusty Anderson, Darren Unterser, Jesse Carmen, Deb Mance, Janelle Campbell, Retha Mattern, and Roxanne Van Summern. It's a wonderful team, so if you could help me acknowledge all their hard work, that would be great. Now I'll turn it over to our Commerce Commissioner, Al Anderson. Thanks, Emily. Thanks to all of you guys for uh, sticking around this entire day. Uh, great conference, and uh, Senator Campbell said that, that uh, he would only stay if I kept my remarks under four minutes. So you can start your clocks right now. My 30 minutes is down to four, okay? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. There, there were four key themes that I kind of took away from, from all of this. One is, uh, is, is foremost, you know, we've been extremely successful uh, over especially the last nine years when you look at when, when this started. Uh, energy security, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the nation has improved dramatically. From North Dakota's standpoint, it, it hasn't been able to get much better. We've been, we've had the highest uh, or the fastest growing economy for the last five years. Our wages are going up. Uh, unemployment's continually uh, down, the lowest it could be, and, and jobs are increasing. So obviously, uh, things are going really well. Second theme that I would say is that, that uh, energy policy in North Dakota is truly all of the above. And you could see that, you know, most of the moderators were, were from the Empower Commission. Uh, I'd like to, to thank those guys for, for doing that. Uh, but probably the more important thing is 
in that nine years, we've not, we've not only more than doubled the energy production, but we've tripled the renewable energy production at the same time. So like many of our presenters said, we have not stayed still. We've been moving along very quickly. And our, in our keynote indicated that, you know, even though the price of oil is down right now, uh, you know, that, that supply demand changes. And by the end of next year, you know, she's forecasting, even though we're not supposed to carry that, she's forecasting that, that things will be improved quite a bit. The other challenge, of course, though, is what, what a lot of our topics were, and that's regulatory environment. And uh, that kind of brings me to the third theme. You know, best policies uh, aren't changing all the time. You know, they're not one size fits all. They're, they're, they're not done in a vacuum. And uh, that's one thing that I would say about North Dakota's policies is they're always looking towards the future. And for all of you folks that spent the entire day, I don't know if you realized it, but the vast majority of the members of the, the Energy Development and Transmission Committee were here. And, and I'd like all of the legislators actually to stand up at this time just so people know who all was here. So please stand up, you guys. Good policy comes from informed decision makers. So thank you guys very much for being here the whole time. Last but not least, fourth one, I'm still under my four minutes, uh, is that you know the future is bright in North Dakota, not only from the innovation side that we just heard about, but, but really from the, the, to me, the basic part is what you saw today. You see all the different groups working together. And we've been doing that for a long time. And I think that's truly the strength of North Dakota and, and getting everybody together, keeping them informed and, uh, and involved probably more than anything else. And you know, in, in today's modern environment, you know, I, I got pinged two different times during this day. And just so you're aware, is that uh, Gallup, you know, they're always, they've got polls, and so they, they just released their state of America's well-being. We weren't number one in a poll for the first time in ages, I think. We were actually number three. So not too bad, even with the price of oil being at $45 per barrel, we're still ranked number three in the entire nation. And the, and the, uh, the, the last one that I thought was most interesting is I just got ping that Forbes has an article uh, by Joel Kotkin, uh, and, it, and it's in the Forbes magazine this week, so check it out. It says, oil bust, and then a dash, bah, North Dakota is still poised to thrive. Thank you all for being here. Have a great day.